So, so about cool. I come here every Friday to buy my greens here. I buy my plants here. It is, it's a wonderful, you guys use no pesticides. I support that. You guys are the greener of the green, I'll call you. But anyone that wants, this is the place to go. So beekeeping, um, it is something that everyone now is very interested in. Uh, when I started 14 years ago, people were kind of like, what are you doing? And what, if, you know, they didn't know that bees were dying off back then. I'm in the environmental field, so kind of get a heads up that where bees were dying off at like 50% a year, every year. Um, and as time went on, I told more and more people, and it seemed like maybe about halfway in between that period, more people knew. I didn't have to tell them. So, and at that same beginning time, I also thought, what could I do other than tell people? I said, well, I'll be a beekeeper. And I gotta tell you, beekeeping is one of those professions that most people get into later in life. The average age of a beekeeper is probably 65, 70, after they retire. Um, and most people, the, the most common complaint of a beekeeper is that they want it to begin earlier. It, it's such a great way uh, of life. Uh, as, uh, I, I call it a way of life, it's, it's a hobby, but for me it's more than a hobby, so I call it a way of life. I also have a, my own career, but this is what I do if I, this is what I would do if I wanted to do something all the time which I'll probably end up doing in retirement. <laughs> so the thing is um, with bees, you can, you can keep a hive, but the most important thing other than, you know, collecting the honey and, and doing all that, you know, fun stuff is keeping them alive. And what I've learned over the years is that they gravitate to flowers anywhere near like these what are these carrots or so forth cilantro. cilantro oh this is cilantro okay cilantro or button uh fly there or or predominantly in this area it's black locusts and white clover i know you have red clover over there so the problem is that in an agricultural setting they spray and they'll spray different types of pesticides. And one of the pesticides they've come up with is neonicotinoids. Um, if you break that down, neo means new, nicotine means nicotine like tobacco and oid is like. So they spray that on plants and the bees, it's a neurological damaging um, element. So you've heard of colony collapse disorder, I think, possibly. It's where the bees go out away from the hive to collect, they never come back. So what happens is that these little guys have a two mile radius for the most part. They, they leave their hive, they can go two miles away and find their way back. It's amazing. Um, but with the neonicotinoids, they found that they start being exposed to it and they, they go out for some reason or other, they can't find them way, their way back. So what, what I've learned is that in this area, we don't have a lot of it. The only real issue we have is on grass. People want a perfect lawn and they use neonicotinoids to kill off the grubs and all that. So what I advocate for people, if they wanna keep the bees alive, if you have a neighbor, tell them, say, look, you don't need to do that. And clover, you shouldn't be ashamed to, to allow your yard to have white clover. It's actually edible. <laughs> the little flowers and, and greens, you can put them in your salad and they're nitrogen fixing. And they're, when other people's yards are dying off for lack of rain, my wife and I, our, our front yard is fully green because half of it is clover. So that's one thing. The other is buy organic. If you want to keep them alive, buy organic that way out in the fields, wherever you're at, where, where they're producing the produce, they're not spraying uh, neonicotines and other nasty stuff. And the third would be to plant flowers. 
flowers are, for them, they produce the nectar. On the other side, you can see it's all clear. I'm not, I can't rotate it now, but in time when you come up, on the other side, you'll see this is capped honey. And before it's capped, it's liquid. And that's nectar. They go to the flower, they pull the nectar, they bring it back and they cap it into here. Um, along with that, when they go out to a flower, I don't know if you could see this picture, and you see the little leg here, Oop. the little leg has pollen on it. So electrostatically, they land on a flower, the nectar collects, on, I mean, yeah, the nectar will collect on their leg and then they take it off and put it in their frames also. The, I'm sorry, the pollen, the pollen, they'll collect the pollen, I meant. So the pollen they put in their frames also, the nectar is the carbohydrate of their diet. The pollen is the protein. So when I used to run in high school, the big thing was like, oh, eat bee pollen and drink honey, you know? And I, I didn't know too much about bees, but the honey definitely gave me energy, but the pollen is intense. You take more than a tablespoon, you're gonna get a stomach ache. It, it's, it's intensely strong. It's got, I think the majority of, it has the majority of the amino acids you need, but it, it's potent food. So the other aspect of this whole thing, people, you know, I have, I have friends that are vegan and they say, well, you're stealing from the bees. And I tell them, well, they're my pets in a sense. I basically keep them and I'm trying to, you know, keep them alive. And I do collect honey, but they only need in a beehive. I have a book here, the back of this or the front. Well, this, this is probably too small, but you'll see if you come up with a hive, you basically, if I could get a better picture, the two bottom parts of it are deeps, the deep hive. And what happens is that, yeah, you'll have to come up and probably look at it later, but as the hive goes higher, you have little supers that you put on top, smaller boxes. And anything in the deeps is their honey. It's a cardinal rule to not take that honey from them. They need that honey to get through the winter. And it's about 60 to 80 pounds that we give them. Anything above that, I harvest. And I always, always leave a little bit, a frame or two outside of that, because in the winter time, if they overeat, I could always feed them more honey, you know, that way. I had one hive last year one in 14 years I've only lost one hive and that was because the one hive was so populated and because the fluctuation in time or weather in February was warm and then cold and warm and cold I think they produced brood which was little eggs which produced more bees and they overate the supply of food that normally happens in March that happened in February so that that's a, a, a that's something to look forward going into the future. I think that may have been a result of like, they say climate change may be creating these fluctuations that are messing with our ecosystem, but I only know over time. But the beauty of it too is, I mean, collecting the honey and giving it back to them gives them microscopic minerals and vitamins in the pollen, there's microscopic pollen from any, if you know of a beekeeper that's collecting his own honey, he's not gonna over filter and he's not gonna heat it. And, and the beauty of that is that when you buy honey from a local beekeeper, you're getting a little bit of pollen in there. So if you have allergies and you take a little bit of honey every day, you, over time, your allergies are gonna lessen or go away. My wife, it took her a year and a half because she's a wife of a beekeeper and she's gotten enough honey every day in her tea that her, her symptoms have gone away. And I've never had them, so I wouldn't have, you know, I'm not a good candidate, but if she were here, she could tell you that. So, but a lot of people buy like two pounds at a sitting and try to eat two pounds around allergy season, any, that's not gonna fly. 
You need to do it year round. <laughs> and only a little bit, like a, a quarter of a tablespoon is all you need. So I, I gave this talk a few years back and um, I had a, a doctor of allergy. The guy was, a, his specialty was allergies, right? And he's like, oh, you would have to eat so much honey that wouldn't be so, you know, he, he was shooting me down. And then afterwards, he wanted to know how to keep bees. So I was wondering, you know, am I, you know, is he, is he trying to get an angle here? So, but either way, it's very funny. From here, I will talk about keeping bees and the tools are very easy. This is the hive tool. I break everything open with that. I can, you know, in between the uh, frames and the boxes, I just break it open and then break out the frames and pull them out. This frame, I put nine of these in a box and that's one box. And then I have two deeps that are longer than that or deeper than that, two of those boxes. And right now I have about four of these boxes on top. That's nine per box, and it's about 35 pounds per box of honey. The deeps, like I say, can go anywhere between 60 and 80 pounds. So you have to have a little bit of strength and a good back. I do a lot of yoga, so I keep myself fit to do this stuff. I mean, you're, you're, it, it's dead weight that you're picking up and moving a lot of times. Um, and then you have the brush, you brush them out of the way, or you can use a smoker to smoke them. The smoke will actually, they'll be repelled by that and walk away or brush them. So when you're moving the boxes, you don't injure any of them. And then this is just a, a tool to get in there and dig out some of the brood to see if there's any varroa mites, which I'll talk about in a moment. So getting back to the smoke, um, when we go into a hive, we smoke the hive first. And what that does is break up their line of communication. The communication, the bees communicate by smell, pheromones. Um, there are certain bees outside that are called sentinel bees. And what they do is watch the hive constantly. They wanna know if other bees are coming in and stealing, which they do. If you have a weak hive, other bees will come in and rob the hive and take honey away or if a beekeeper or an other animal, like a, a human goes in there, they alert the other bees by sense of smell. So, but if you smoke them and in front of the hive, they, that chain of communication is broken up. The other thing that you wanna be very uh, cautious with when working with bees or if there's a bee around you is not to like any fast motions. The natural instinct is to swipe at a bee, get it away from me, right? So they have a compound eye. The compound eye sees like 20 different pictures of what's in front of it. If it sees any kind of fast motion, it knows something's up and it will go right at you. Um, if you run, it sees that motion, it'll follow you. <laughs> if you go into war, I've heard if you go like dive into water, it will linger around and when you surface, it will come at you. So there's no way around it. You just have to be very slow. And, and I gotta tell you, when I open up the hive every now and then and I'm working very slowly, they move out of my way. And I, the only way I could describe it is I think they think I'm a big bee helping them because and, and every now and then, when I'm away from it, they'll buzz around me. They won't sting me, but I don't know what they're doing. They're, I don't know if they're trying to tell me something or what. It, it, because otherwise, why would, it be come, why would it waste its time lingering around me if it didn't want to sting me or anything else, you know? So there, there's some, something else going on there that I, I can't put my finger on. Um, I think, oh, beeswax is another product. Um, beeswax is incredible. We used it way before we had petroleum-based uh, wax. Um, this burns cleaner than any kind of candle out there. Predominantly, not because of what it's made of, but it burns hotter. It, it's complete combustion. When you have a candle, like a traditional candle on the beeswax, look at the top of it, the wick, at the wick, if there's like black soot coming off one, 
that's not the one that's beeswax. The beeswax will be complete combustion and burn completely, which leads to better air quality indoors. Um, the other item is propolis. So I have propolis here if you guys want to come up and play with it later. Propolis is the bee glue. What they do is they go to trees, they chew on the resin, they chew on it and spit it out and they make glue. They make the, this stuff is like varnish now, but if I got it out of the beehive, it would be like Play-Doh. And what they do is if there's like a hole in a hive, they caulk it up with this stuff. But and I have some articles here on propolis so that you know how it's spelt. Propolis is Greek. And basically this stuff is extremely medicinal. Um, they're using it in chemotherapy treatments now. They're experimenting with it. Um, I've had a couple cold sores over the years and I read about it. I pinched this off between my tooth and gum. By the end of the day, it's gone. Um, warts. I've had a couple warts I put on it with a band-aid. A couple weeks later, gone. This stuff is antibacterial, antiviral, and antifungal. Um, the literature's all here. I played with it. I put it in my lip balm that I make. And one of my friends said, whatever she's ever used, it never worked. This, the lip balm worked. And she just, I had to make an extra batch because she wanted to buy like five, like stalks of, of lip balm from me. So if, if nothing else, if, if you're away traveling, whatever, and you come upon a bee, um, beekeeper and you need something like that, just ask for that. Because a lot of beekeepers will throw that away. That's like, they, it, it'll bulk up the hive and it, it's, it's too much and they just scrape it off. You know, you take your scraper and you're scraping off the hive and this stuff like putties up onto it. And you're like, I don't want this. And you throw it away. And yet that stuff, if you look it up online, it's, you know, people are selling it for everything and anything, you know, for any ailment, but play with it. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to say it cures everything, but like I said, it's antiviral, antibacterial, and antifungal. So it, it's an amazing product just to be aware of. Um, where can I go from here? I think I will take questions from you guys. Yes, let me see. Um, I heard that mushrooms uh, like that grow out of like old wood is like an antibiotic for uh, bees. Have you heard about that? No, I haven't. Um, I don't have it. Do I have it with me? Okay. What the old wood has an antibacterial? Okay, I'm not not so. Um, if you if you could send that to me or give that to me when I see you. I think it's uh, what's that guy? Michael Paul Stama from uh, the mushrooms. Yes. Yeah, okay. I, I do follow him. And he basically, I'm glad you, that's a great segment here, seg segmenting into this. Um, I'm part of a study now where they're taking reishi mushrooms and they're putting them in a the smoker and they're smoking the bees with this because there's something I didn't cover, the virilla mites are, um, it's like a little crab that gets on the back of the bee and sucks the blood out of it. It also infects the bees. and. What they're learning now is that if, if you smoke them or you use, I use a thymol, which is a concentrated thyme oil, and you put that in the hive, it'll fumigate the hive and they'll leave the, the varroa mites. You could also use formic acid, which is also natural. Um, formic acid is what the bees use, or the ants use to inject their prey and kill them. So those two things are considered organic, but this may be the third item, the reishi, reishi mushroom. It's a dried cross section of it. I'm putting it in the smoker and smoking half my hives with it and smoking the other with pine and, uh, needles. And we're doing control studies that way, one with and one without. And I won't know till the end of the summer what's gonna happen because there's trays underneath the bee uh, hives and I pull them out and I can actually count the uh, varroa mites that I, I count that are, are dead. So 
That's up and coming. Uh, a woman, another beekeeper from Pennsylvania reached out to us and said, would you do this? I'm like, yeah, I'll try it out. But that's Paul, Paul Stammen out of um, Washington State. Did anyone see Fantastic Fungi? Yes. All right, if you haven't seen it, um, what can I say? It is one of those feel good movies, but it's kind of, how would you say? Um, amazing. amazing, yeah, it, it just changes your perspective of mushrooms and medicinal mushrooms and everything else. And it just gives you hope, put it that way. And you know, he was saying how important rotting wood is in the forest. Oh, because of the mushrooms, yes. Yeah, and that the bees actually get, that's how, it's like a natural antibiotic. Uh, I got it. So, that, so I was wondering if you have like rotting wood on your... No, I don't, but they have a two mile radius, so they'll seek out. Um, the clear sign that a tree is dying is that you're gonna have mushrooms on it. Yes. Uh, because the defense of the tree, they excrete defensive um, mechanisms like uh, oils and, and different things. They'll secrete that to kill off different insects and mushrooms and all that. And when you start to see mushrooms on a tree in your house, you know that that, that tree's in decline. So, but then the bees probably go there, you know. Most of the time they'll go to it because it's damp and they'll take the moisture off it. So that, that's one reason. So any other, is anybody interested in, go ahead. Did you say Paul Stamets. Stamets, S-T-A-M-E-T-S. Okay. I was wondering why they produce more honey than they need. Do you have any idea? Supply, demand. Um, they demand only so much. Supply, there's so much out there, plus they don't stop working. <laughs> Does that make sense? So, put it in human terms. Um, I can work, I can work, I could 12, I can work 12 hours a day, seven days a week and make an income. I do that for a few, put me and 50,000 of my friends out there to do that or, or my family. Put it in human terms again, five people working seven days a week, 12 hours a day or 10 hours a day, just working, 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 nonstop, no breaks, no nothing. You're gonna, after a while, you're gonna amass some fortune, right? After, so bees, a, a hive will have about 50,000 bees in it, if it's healthy, in the summertime. It comes down to about 30, or maybe, I should say maybe 10 to 20 in the winter. But what they do is they work, they work, they work, they bring back, and they stockpile it. So, if it's a drought, I don't get anything. If there's a disease, they die off, I don't get anything. Um, in those situations, I don't. But if it's a year like this, where I'm gonna have to harvest this week or next week, because I don't have any more boxes left with um, frames in it, it's gonna be a bumper crop. But there's been years when we get nothing but rain. And what happens is when flowers bloom and it rains all the time, the bees can't go out to get it. And then the flower, the wind and the rain will blow the flowers away. So the black locust is a good example. This year it was out for 10 days. And I never knew the black locust. I knew of the tree, but I didn't know the particular, you know, that they, they, they flowered on top until someone pointed it out to me. And they said, look, that's the black locust. That's where they're getting their honey. And the whole tree is covered with flowers and then the white clover you know it, it's in your yard if for one reason or other it doesn't come out because of too much rain or whatever that that's more of an oddity but or a drought if it doesn't rain enough then you don't have enough of, uh, of nectar coming in those years i have to feed them other years there's a surplus more than they they need okay yeah so, any of us, anyone want to be a beekeeper? All right. What? I'd love to eventually. Okay, I mean, eventually. Okay, so. I don't own my own home yet, so I don't think my neighbors were the right. taste of the bees. All right. You could always ask someone if they have a plot of land. You need a quarter acre in New Jersey. Quarter yeah, and you could join the New Jersey Beekeepers Association, and they got the, and you could look it up on the um, Department of Agriculture has the guidelines. You gotta be like 30 feet away. 
there's a lot of guidelines there, but once you become um, a member or if you know another beekeeper, we have kind of a code between us that I learned from a beekeeper at no cost and we just don't charge. That's not our style, it's not our thing. We just, whoever we teach, you know, and then if you need help and the circle continues forever. Trust me. I mean, there's older, I know beekeepers in their nineties that I'm learning from and there's beekeepers that just started I'm learning from and they're learning from me. So it, it just, it's always continuing. And it, it's a great hot, like I said, I, I can travel, I'll, I'll get into honey now. I can travel and I take half pounders with me. And if I go, we went out to Colorado, I've been out to um, Oregon this past year, and I'll go to a, a, a farmer's market, or if I've been to like France or, you know, Spain or somewhere far away, I'll still take it. And I'll go to a farmer's market and I'll meet up with another beekeeper and I'll say, I'm a beekeeper, would you like to exchange? And they're, they're happy. And I tell them where it's from and the trees. And before you know it, we're talking about bees. You could be of any nationality, anything in, you could be from any country in the world. And I, I guarantee if you're a beekeeper, this is gonna lead you to meeting new friends, anyone. Even political differences don't matter. I, I know lots of people I don't agree with or whatever. This is, is the answer to world peace, I think. So I I really, it. really, I, it, it's, so here, here is different types of honey. This is my honey uh, that I won three times in Monmouth County Blue Ribbon in two years actually, 2019 was 2018 supply that they, they sample one best in the state the only thing i can say is that this area of new jersey is called honey heaven by the old time beekeepers because once you go inland it's all wildflower and it's not as good this is like nectar of the of the flower the other thing to know is that if you know a beekeeper try to get the honey like the month that it's harvest because even though this is good you get it when it's harvest it's better it, you could smell the difference. It's, it's fresh. So this, this is blueberry honey. You can see the color difference. This is from South Jersey. I've got other honeys. This is solidified honey, my honey that solidifies, which doesn't mean it's bad. It may even mean that it may have more pollen in it because the pollen acts as something that the crystals link onto and then replicates from there. So this may have more pollen in it than that one. This one's from Virginia. I mean, this is from uh, Vermont. Someone brought back for me. This is from um, Cape Cod. Now I was at a farmer's market up there a few years back and the guy said, come visit me at my house. So I, I, I end up going with my uncle and we, we show up and he's in the middle of like an area of Cape Cod that is off a dirt road. He, he gave me direction. He said, your GPS is not gonna work in that part of, of Cape Cod, near Turo, between there and, and a little bit south. And we get there and lo and behold, we're talking about hives and this and that. And I'm in his basement after a while and I'm drinking mead with him. He made mead and we're drinking mead. And it's just, it's a wonderful way of, you know, to connect. This is from Maryland, someone got me that. I mean, that's the other part of being a beekeeper. People bring you gifts constantly <laughs> and honey. It's like, look at this, look at that. And this, I got this like, I don't know, over 15 years ago in Mexico. I never opened it for some reason. I found it in the pantry, but this is a very dark honey. And that, that's the other thing is that depending on the flower is gonna be the color and texture and taste of the honey. So this is black locust white clover, and this is blueberry. This has a fruity taste to it and a whole different color. It's kind of akin to like drinking wine. You'll, you'll, you'll taste different wines or, or whatever, different types of food. Um, I'm trying to think of other relationships, uh, different maple syrups sometimes. They'll have different flavors, different colors to them. But you know, wherever you go, you're gonna find honey. And it's just an amazing, 
I don't know. It, I can't. Once you're into it, you you really don't want to leave it. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. What's the shelf life on these? Uh, All right. So, does everyone know that they found honey in the Egyptian tombs? Honey, um, they found it. It was crystallized, but still good. It wasn't crystallized. Um, one of the reasons why is that maybe the beekeeper allowed crystals or um, a little moisture in the comb when they put it back, and it replicated the crystal itself. And the other is that it may have a lot of pollen in it, and then it'll replicate, if it has a little bit of crystal, like I said, link onto that pollen and then crystallize off of that. Um, I mean, I have some of this that is like five years old and hasn't crystallized, and then this one's like two years old and crystallized. So depending, that's the other thing. Year to year to year, you're gonna get different honeys. You, it may look the same, but it's gonna taste a little bit different. And the year that I won for the state was amazing, because my neighbor and I, we harvested it, and we're going through the different combs, and one was like crystal clear. And I'm like, that's gotta be black locusts. We're gonna harvest that separately, and we did. And that's what I entered into the contest and, and there's a whole line of like criteria. Lo and behold, I got a hundred out of a hundred. Now the old timers told me, we, did, we don't remember getting that ever. Like your honey was, other than the taste, everything was. And I said, well, I found the right, right couple frames to pull it from. He said, most people just blend it. They bring everything together and they put it all together. He said, you were extremely lucky to see it, to capture it and to bottle it like that. And I met a guy in Trenton, they, they have a school out there, ISIS, I think it's called, or um, I-S-L-E-S, IELTS, you know it. So I met them at the farmer's market because I work in Trenton. And I was talking to him about, well, I, I had one a couple of years ago, he said, you're the guy, you're the guy that got the 100. I'm like, yeah, I, I couldn't figure that out either. He came in second that year. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, I was, he was wondering who the heck got 100 because he got like a 98 or something like that. And I was like, you know, and, and we swapped honey the next week. That's at the Green Market or something, Green Avenue or something. But I, I work about a block away from there, from my uh, state job, but um, that was great. And that, that's a connect also. I mean, you, you, you're in this world of bees and it gravitates to so many different cultural and, and you know, international and, like I said, it, it really connects people, which I, I really love getting into that world. Um, some more questions. I think I, yes. I'm just wondering if you wanted to be, have a hive in your backyard, how much space do you need? All right, a quarter acre is the minimum, and I, I believe you could have three hives. Um, about three years ago, the state wanted to take the bat beekeeper privilege away. Because what happened was um, someone up in Bergen County with a small plot of land had like 20 hives behind their house and they started swarming. Um, do I have a picture? This is a swarm. Okay. All right, that, that gets me into that. So swarming happens when the hive is too populated or the queen is failing and they create another queen. The way they create another queen is they feed the cell of the bee, the, the larvae, more pollen than nectar. They could actually create a queen by doing that, and they know how to do that. So, but what happened was that they had like all these swarms and people freaked out, and there, lo and behold, there was a lawyer, we're in Jersey, that said, and he knew a legislator and said, we gotta outlaw this. Well, lo and behold, did he know that we're a brotherhood of beekeepers and we have lawyers too that will work for us for free. So what happened was um, we sat them down and said, look, we go by guidelines. They didn't go by guidelines when they were doing that. We'll work with you. We'll rewrite this. We'll work with you. If you outlaw us, there's 2,000 of us. There's actually 2,000 beekeepers in the state and friends of beekeepers. 
the legislator you talk to, we're campaigning against him. And the guy's like, oh, I want my job. You know, that's how Jersey works. So, so we're, we're reasonable, we'll do the right thing, we'll give you guidelines. You just can't tell us we can't do it. And, in, and I and others got on that group and we wrote our legislators, I met with them and we made that change. That was like a plunge into the Jersey political world, but you know, it, it worked, it worked. But getting back to that, you need about a quarter acre, you could have three hives, or you can find a piece of land and ask them if you could have bees there. I'll work with you if, if you're in the area. There's a lot of people that have asked me to keep bees on their property, but I, I don't have enough time. Good. How much attention do they need? What's that? How much attention does it take? All right. Um, this time of the year, a lot. When I harvest, it takes like two full days. And if it's hot out, you're talking like drenched in sweat uh, working. But um, normally I tell people it's between keeping um, a dog and a goldfish. All right. So sometimes you're not really doing much. Other times in the beginning of the year, you got to monitor them, open up the hive, um, look for disease, make sure that if they need another box of uh, box, put another box on for more honey, because if they get too, too congested, they start swarming. That's the other secret. If you keep enough room, they feel like they have enough room to expand. If they don't, then they just like, all right, they create the, uh, with the swarm, they create the other queen. I don't know if I went over that. They create another queen. Half of them go with the other queen. And they, 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 in their, in swarm mode, I don't know if you've ever seen them swarm. They're not, they're very docile. They, I, I could literally take my hand and pick them up and, and put them on a table. But that said, um, they're do all they're doing is looking for another place to live and they gorge themselves on honey before it has anyone seen that video of the woman down in texas with the yeah so so the woman down in texas was in a, an old barn or something she took up the floor and she came up with like this stuff a wild hive right so she's down there and she has no protection on and she's as handling them like it's nothing and you could do that sometimes I, I did that in the beginning too but unfortunately if you step on them and they're all over and one doesn't if you've accidentally killed one they know that and then they tend to go after you they're like if you kill one of us we're going after you the other part of that is that in texas they have the africanized uh, uh, bees that originally were from Brazil. They brought them over from Africa to Brazil and they were experimenting thinking that this would be a great aggressive bee to produce more. And it, it just wasn't. They are, be they, they may be the saving, as, as the decades go on, they may become the prevalent bee and they are more aggressive. So they may save mankind in the end. But at this point, if you're around them, they'll, they'll kill you. Um, if there's too many of them. The other thing is that she got a lot of flack because she used no protection. I've got a bee suit here with the veil and all, and I don't have a picture, I could take it out later, but it's got the veil, you use gloves, and your pants you tape off because they crawl up your legs and they'll, they'll sting you on your legs. I've got, I, once I got, I didn't do that, and I got like five stings on an ankle. What's good about that? It boosts your immunity. Um, and they'll, if you read up on this, um, University of Hartford in Connecticut, or University of uh, Connecticut in Hartford, did a study where uh, beekeepers were stung and also found ticks on them for Lyme disease up in Connecticut. None of them came down with Lyme disease. The reasoning they, they feel is that when you're stung by a bee, your immunity is boosted. Your whole body is on like alert. And what happens is just with COVID, they found too, is that if your immunity is boosted, it's gonna fight off everything around you. It doesn't matter. So 
lo and behold, it, it, it's, it's good. And, and there's stuff called sting therapy with people that have arthritis and all. Um, I've gotten a couple extra bees that weren't healthy and, and a woman I know in Belmar there um, basically said she needed some and I'd give it to her and she would just sting her hand where she had arthritis and it, it inflames it, boosts her immunity, but it, I guess the inflammation of it gave her um, no pain for a few days. So in that sense, it's beneficial too. So did I get off track with anyone? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> There's that so much was super to cover. interesting. Now I'm wondering why you wouldn't want to have I guess it's hard to make sure, but what would happen if they made another queen right. and they swarmed with half the, half the group of bees right. to where you could then have a second hive and then the bee population would go up? Yeah, yeah, okay, two things there. Um, I, I'm on a swarm list, so, or within my circle of people I know, that know I'm a beekeeper, they'll call me up and say, oh, we got a swarm in Eaton Town. I did that twice this year already. And what I do is I take a box, and if it's on a branch, they're literally like this on a branch. You just basically cut the branch, or if you shake it, they fall into the box. You fold the box up, you bring it home, you open a hive, you shake them into the hive, and if you're lucky, they'll stay there and you put the frames in there and voila, you have instant bees. You don't have to, I've got my first hive that way. Uh, we actually, I was with friends, we actually bought bees, but then I, I didn't have them in my front yard, I wanted them there. And then another beekeeper here in Asbury called me up, but I had to go up a ladder like 20 feet and capture them, which I don't do anymore because I, another beekeeper fell off a ladder, broke his hip, I'm like, I ain't doing that. So, but, I took the chance, the risks, I got them, and now that's how I started. But did that answer everything? I oh oh, and then okay, so okay, no. The other the other part of that component of the question was that if you have too many bees, I think you can actually have too many bees in an area, and they will over like we talked about the size of the hive and the honey they can overstrip the supply of nectar out there. So if like this area had like 50 hives, within two miles you had like pockets of more and more bees out there, like maybe a hundred beehives, there wouldn't be enough food for them all. That's a problem. And I imagine they're very adapted to their local yes. environment. You yeah. can't take these bees like ship them off to the west coast or something. Good point. Um, I boycott almonds now because of that. Um, the, the small beekeeper in Monmouth County or within this area, bless you, within this area, we keep our bees, I, for a few years it was 100% and then I lost some one hive. I must be like 80 or 90% of bees year by year by year, keeping them alive. Other beekeepers do the same for the most part. Um, when they ship them out, they put them on U-Haul trucks or big, you know, semis and ship them out to California. Every winter, they ship them out there and that, that's nothing but monoculture, uh, the almond groves. That's all they feed on. Plus you got, they estimate 80% of all the commercial bees are shipped out there you got that many bees in one place, you're gonna get diseases and things, or whatever. And then they, they found that over maybe about 50% a year dive just because of that. There's ways to manipulate them so that you can bring another queen on board and more bees, but it's not, it's not sustainable. You know, I'm in the environmental field, it, it's gonna, one year that number is, could take them all out. In which case, during one of our bee meetings, we had an uh, entomologist, Dr. Seeley from um, Cornell. I don't know if you know who he is. He's a big time uh, entomologist with bees. He said, you guys think nobody knows about you. He says, the government probably has all your names and where you live because if the bees die off, they're coming knocking on your doors, possibly taking your bees from you. We're like, what? He says, yeah, that, that's how dangerous that situation is. Because they go from California, 
They go to Florida for um, the oranges, they go to Maine for the blueberries, but they, they ship them constantly. I, I don't get that, you know? And I have friends that say, oh, you, you, you can make $500 a hive and lend them out to them, but you get them back, I don't even want to do it for them. The money is not the point. It's just, it's not, it's not good, you know? So I'd rather be small and be happy. It's just that, you know, but you could you become rich and unhappy. <laughs> Is there a certain time of year you should start, like if you wanted to start? Yes. Um, you want to begin with the hive maybe in April, probably late, depending on the weather because it's cold, but you want to get them established and you want to buy bees from someone that had them in New Jersey because they're acclimated. A lot of times they come in from California or the Carolinas. They don't get through the next winter. My bees and my friend's bees, other fellow beekeepers, they're out there at like 30, upper 30, like, you know, 38, 39, 40 degrees. They're out there flying. They're not collecting, but they're outside the hive. You bring bees in from, um, California or wherever, it's gotta be like 50 degrees. So, but, and the other question, other part of that is in April, traditionally is when your black locusts come out, the flowers, and you get 40% to 50% of all the honey that you collect right from them. And then the rest of the year is white clover and variety. But, you know, best to like line up where you're gonna get the bees in the winter, yeah. get all your supplies. I have books here, if anyone wants these, I only have two, but, this is one of the big distributors and it has all the pricings and all the material that you want in there and all the tools. And you get all this in the winter time, read up on it, you know, realize what a hive is and what it takes and become part of the association. They have workshops and they have information meetings and all that. Get yourself geared up for all that and then you can dive into it. And also get a mentor. That's real important. You do need a mentor, I think. You could take the Rutgers course, but I didn't. But it's a lot of information in a short period of time. I, I think you need it over a length of time. You have to open up a hive every weekend to see what's happening. And do you have to do anything in the winter, like in the snow? Do you leave them outside or do they have to go somewhere? All right. Like so. Um, with the neonicotinoids, they also say, oh, I'll, I'll talk about this too, but the nicoti nicoti nicotinoids also lower their ability to uh, maintain heat in the uh, winter. And how they maintain heat in the winter, it could be 10 degrees outside, inside the hive, they cluster together and they vibrate. And that friction can get up to 90 degrees, I've been told, in the hive. And when I, if I ever have to, by chance, open a hive in the winter, they're all in the center, in the middle. And they cling together and they create this rotating ball. You know, the inner go to the out and so forth. They just continue that way. And what happens is they, they feed off the honey because that's carbohydrates, calories. It's like running a marathon constantly and they keep feeding off that honey. So every now and then I have to move the frames to them so they don't starve. And also um, I get a lot of flack from other beekeepers sometimes because I put a, a blanket on them in the winter because it's not so much the cold, but the wind. If the wind gets in there, the wind chill, if, if there's a little hole in the hive or an area where the wind can get in there, that wind chill can kill them. And I, I blanket them down. I get wool blankets at Harbor Freight for like real cheap. I wear, I use wool because it's not synthetic and it keeps its warmth. And I tie it around it and that keeps them through the winter. And, and that basically other beekeepers are like, ah, oh, they've, they, you know, they've gone through millions of years. You don't need to do that. But the, the nicotinoids they found interrupts that. If anyone read the coaster here, the coaster, the uh, local, here's a local paper of the area, the coaster. Okay, so if you do get it, and some places give it away for free, on page 10, this week, 
Um, they basically have saved New Jersey beads, which I was surprised to see. And I'll, show, I'll leave it up here. And they talk about neonicotinoids. And it's by the New Jersey Conserva Conservation Foundation. So I was like, wow. I've, I've, been, I've learned about them probably 10 years ago. And back then I was telling other beekeepers about it. Like, oh, no, no, no. But trust me, there's a lot out there that people don't know. And it's only a few years down the line that everyone tends to know, but it, it's information you need. And it's sort of like in the beginning when I said the bees were not all dying or they, they had the risk of dying and no one knew that. Now it's hard to find someone that doesn't know it and they want to know what to do. Like I said, you, you know, you, you buy organic plant flowers, and, and, and just um, don't use pesticides or don't long. This also talks about uh, lawns. Having that perfect lawn uses neonicotinoids, believe it or not, because that, that kills off the grubs and that, but it's not necessary. There's other ways around it. So questions, please. About the last thing you said, my neighbor is like fanatical and I, my, and I know my lawn drives him crazy. Yeah. I don't know how to talk to him because... Yeah. Give, give this article okay. to him. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I've done that for a lot of things. So they don't believe what I'm talking about. Oh, you found out on the internet. That must be some, you know. He even, like cut part of the fence and went under and like did some stuff on my property when I was away one weekend and I was like, oh. We could talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, exactly. It's weird. I mean, I have the same issues with Roundup with my town. Six years ago, I told them that it created non-Hopkins uh, lymphoma in children and, and other people. And then they're spraying the soccer fields down with it. Well, one girl, unfortunately, before all that came down, and I'm like, don't do this. So the one little park near me, um, I talked to the town. I was part of the town at that time, volunteering. They ignored me. Then all my neighbors got wind of it with kids. And they started calling the town up. So my little park and my section of town doesn't do that anymore because one of the neighbors saw the lawn care come with a fire hose spraying Roundup on all the kids' equipment and then put flags down and the kids went on the equipment. I'm like, what are you doing? So they know better now, but it takes a while and unfortunately it takes something bad to happen sometimes. It's sad. But, you know, it, it's just uh, too much. Um, I have a question. I have like mosquitoes in my yard. And um, so I was thinking about getting one of those organic companies. But then, and they ah. say it's safe for bees, but I was like You have leery. any standing water? Um, I've been ch doing stuff for years. I've been there seven years. And All I'm right. If you have standing water, they, they sell the donuts now at Home Depot. You put that in there. Um, mosquitoes, yeah, they, they're, they're brutal. They, they land on you, and by the time you could get to them, they're gone. They're like a whole new breed. So how are the organic, you know, the average? I don't know too much about that. I know what you're talking about. Cinnamon I, and um, something else. Cedar. Yeah, bite, last bite or something like that. Oh, it's cinnamon and cedar. Yeah. You, okay, so what you want to do is ask for a MSDS, Material Data Safety Sheet. That'll break down what's in it. Because with the Roundup, with the town, well, we don't use that. I asked for it from Green Lawn, whatever. Glycophosphate, that's Roundup. Oh, we didn't know that. You know, it's, you, you ask for the information, you get it. You look it up, do a little research, you'll know. It's, you know, it's with everything else. You know, you gotta do your own little research. Or otherwise, if you're gonna be led and conned, as I say, it's all a con game. <laughs> Until you find out it's not, you know. I don't know. I'm a little pessimistic that way. So speaking of con games, I've been noticing like some honeys, they say it's organic. And I thought like all honey was organic. Like what's um, up with that? I don't tell people it's organic, mine, because I really don't know where it's going. But I can tell you that the black locust doesn't have anything on it and a white clover. If they're treating a lawn, there's no white clover on it. It's all green, green grass. Um, what I worry about is that when they do spray a lawn with Roundup, that the bees land on it like it's water. 
and they will think it's water and they will, but they'll probably die off. That's the problem. Um, and when they say honey is organic, you should do a test on that honey to make sure, but a lot of that stuff's coming out of Brazil in areas where no one's ever been. And I kind of believe that, but anything in New Jersey is, if you're in an agricultural area, sometimes you don't know what they're using, or if you're the, the other beekeeper and, and what they're using to treat the varilla mites. A lot of this stuff um, is pesticides. I don't, okay, you got me onto a good point here. So I use thymol. If you know what, I, I talked about thymol. Thymol is um, concentrated thyme oil. Open up a bottle of Listerine, smell it. That's thymol. If you look on the label, that's thymol. I didn't know that until I started playing with this. I'm like, that smells familiar. That's Lysol. That's the number, it's an antibacterial. It fumigates the hive, it's natural. Uh, fumic acid is considered also organic. I do that. Um, a lot of times when we harvest, we take the frame off and we store it. But before you store it, you have to treat it for wax moth. You know, you have like wool, wool clothing and, and the moth will go in there and eat up the wool, put holes in it. The same is true with wax. There's a wax moth out there. Um, people use mothballs to treat it. You know what mothballs are? I'm in the environmental field. I think paradichlorobenzene, I think is what they are, if I remember correctly. You guys know your chemistry? Paradichlorobenzene, benzene being toxic. So if you store this in a box over the winter with that, it's going to get into the wax. The next year you put it in the hive, the bees are going to be affected by it and your honey is going to have it in it. How do you get around that? Well, the wax moth has little eggs that you can't see. You can freeze them, but I have so many frames, I don't have that much room. So I'm driving to Belmore one, Belmar on uh, 35 one day, and before you go over the bridge, there's midway ice, right? I go, I pulled a couple other places in between, and I, I said, can I bring my hives? I put them in um, boxes and, and wrap them in plastic. I'll bring them, I just need to freeze them for two days. Oh no, we can't do that a couple places. So I'm, I'm on my way to Belmore and I see Midway. I stop in there. I'm like, all right, I'll give it a go, right? The guy says, my son just took a beekeeping class down in North Carolina. I know exactly what you're talking about. Bring it on. So I brought them there. I, it only takes two days. I froze them all. I bring them back and he gets a big bottle of honey. So every year I get a big thank you card from him too. So it, it, it's that way. You know, you find solutions when you can. You know, there's always a way to find a solution, I think. So, questions? <laughs> so you said you needed a quarter of an acre for three hives. Yes. So what other kind of habitat parameters would you need, especially if you live in an urban environment like Asbury or Long? Um, I believe you have to be 30 feet away. To place your hive? Yeah, to place the hive 30 feet away. You can't do it on the property line. 30 feet, away 30 feet away, you should have it in a, well, the other guideline other than the law is that you should have it in a sunny place. Supply water. Um, you put like a bird bath or something concrete or something that they can drink the water. If they don't, you don't have water, they're gonna to go to your neighbor's pool. And that's a problem. So it can't really be in under like the, a shade tree or things like it's gotta be out in the open, it, like in the lawn uh, habitat. The best way it's been described to me is that when the sun hits the hive in the morning, they wake up and they're out collecting. I've, I've, kept, I've kept bees in another part of Neptune and the problem was it was under a tree. And then you get stuff like hive beetles and fungus and things. It's not really good, I don't think. Um, my hives get about, I don't know, five hours of sun. And I have other hives in Neptune also, no, another bee yard that gets more sun. And I, you know, I've, I've had beekeepers that had full sun all day in Neptune, got 250 uh, pounds of honey from one hive. The, the norm is about 40. I get about, about 100, 125. Wow. But that's, 
countless hours. You, people say, oh, you, you're making out like a bandit. But getting back to like, you know, the, the relationship of what you do and what you get, you put in so many hours year round. And, it, you know, it, it comes down to less than probably minimum wage when I'm making, probably much less. And then you have to supply and keep it going and this and that. And then, you know, but it's, it's a labor of love. It's what I love and I'll just keep doing it. Plus it's priceless. If I meet other beekeepers wherever I go in the world and they're like, you know, come to our house and or, or check my hive out and whatever, you know, that's, that's something you cannot, you know, you, you just, it's, it's priceless as they say, you know, and then talking to other beekeepers, wherever they are, you know, it's just, it's a brotherhood, you know, and if you guys know any vets, people that have served in the military, they actually call brothers and bees. There's an organization called brothers and bees where bee, uh, veterans get together and they all keep beehives. And it, it's, it's known to be a known, like just like working in a garden, keeping bees does keep you calm. And it, 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 it grounds you, you know. It makes you, gives you gratitude, I think, an awful lot. So, it is what it is. Just to get started. Um, as I said, these catalogs have everything, you know, you basically need a hive, yeah. the tools, the veil, the gloves. This will have everything, <clears throat> excuse me, everything in it. And basically it has other stuff too. But if you belong to the bee organization, you get the extractor for free, you get some other things, you get the workshops. Um, you get the hive, you can buy bees, or you can also um, capture a swarm, which is easy, trust me. You'd be surprised, you could do it. I, I taught, I have a friend out in, um, he worked in, um, on a Navisink in uh, Middletown, one of the largest states over there, and he was the groundskeeper. And basically he was keeping everything going and a swarm was happening, right? And the person that owned the property said, I want to have a beehive. I want that swarm, you know. And he's like, he calls me up. I said, and I talk him into it. I said, get a box, shake him into it. And then I gave him a box to keep them in. And then he bought all the other equipment. And lo and behold, he kept bees for the homeowner, which was probably 10 houses away from Bon Jovi. So, We've theorized that it may have been offspring from Bon Jovi's bees, but lo and behold, he had to break that hive up, and I got some of those bees to add to my hive, so now I have that lineage. I don't know. I got famous bees. I don't know. It's, it's a weird dynamics going on. But, yes? How long does a bee live? All right, good question. In the summertime, I think about three weeks, they... they, they wear themselves out constantly going constantly doing they do sleep at night it's a fallacy that they don't they do other bees they'll, they'll create a string of bees in a line and the other bees will hold on to them and they like hang off the other bees it's really cool the other thing is that um, the queen will live up to five years and the drones will they're born in the spring they make it into the fall. Their only mission is to mate with the queen. Once that's done, they, they die in after the mating. But if they survive in the fall, the drones have no purpose other than they eat too much honey. All I didn't get into this, but all the workers are female. My wife, my wife loves this and other women at times really love it. They get kicked out of the hive. They're, they're thrown out. They're literally, that's it. You're out of here. So that happens. Um, in the wintertime, they can live up to like, they can live much longer in the wintertime, like three months. But they're, they're not active. So I, I could see something's going on here. Like, you know. We, we know each other. Okay. I, I know. It, it, a lot of people say they're better off than we are, you know. They, go ahead. Now, do you ever keep the honeybees and mason bees together or no. in the same mm. um, area? 
Good question. No, I do keep little um, native bee boxes and the, ma the mason go in there, but you can't really keep them together. They're a whole different species. Oh, oh, in the same area, not in the same box. Yeah, but the same area, definitely. And yeah, not not next to each other, but like in my garden, I, I keep the little um, bamboo uh, hive. You know, the, the, the little house with the bamboo, um, hollow bamboo shoots in it, and they live in there. And then in our front yard, we have bumblebees that are probably 20 feet away from the hive, and they come out. that's random yeah so but i mean that and then if you have like a tree with a hole in it or something you'll get bees in there okay. but yeah now they, they don't and they don't compete with each other if i have like something's out and it's food or whatever and they're on it the other bees go right up to it and they're like they could care less okay. but with like the the wasp and the um hornets and all that they're nasty they're very nasty and i you know people say ah, i gotta Kill them. And I've caught a couple of wasp uh, nests with the smoke, uh, smoker and a veil on. I'll wrap them in plastic, smoke them, and then take them somewhere else and let them go. But, you know, I don't mind if they, if they don't make it because they're, they're, they're nasty. They'll sting you multiple. When a bee stings you, it dies. Okay. The, the, you know, the stinger is attached to your abdomen. It rips them out, but the wasp can sting you multiple times and they don't care. They're like, aggressive and honeybees I walk past the hive they bounce off my forehead or if I'm around the land on me and I just pick them up and they won't sting the only reason they'll sting is if someone goes into a hive and they threaten them then they're defensive for the honeybee at least the other thing I wanted to bring up is that the honeybee is not native um, it is brought over from Europe a lot of people think, oh, they're native, they're, they've always been here. No, they, they were brought over from Europe to, to use in the fields for the, you know, pollination of uh, our produce, which all goes back into why, you know, these guys are so important is because two thirds of our food plus is dependent on them. So without them, you, you've probably all seen that wherever Whole Foods or wherever, where if the bee dies, we die. I think Einstein's, there's a fallacy that says that Einstein said that in six weeks we're dead if they die. I don't think he ever said that, but he's, but it's very close to that. If they die, what are we going to do? There's, I could go on and on. There's so much I know about this, but leaving that in, in China, has anyone been to Beijing or um, Beijing, China, the capital? So back in the seventies, Mao Zedong, and, and group got pissed off because there were too many insects around Beijing. They doused it with so much pesticides that to today, there's no insects and no birds in like this zone. And in the farms, they have to take feather, like peacock feathers and pollinate one flower to another. They have to do it by hand. That's what we're looking at. If the bees die or we use too many pesticides and all, and they die off, forget it. We're, what, the neonicotinoids and all that are banned in Europe. You know that, yeah. I mean, we're, this country, it's a wake up call, you know. But we're learning, you know, slowly. We'll wake up. Okay. Questions, questions. So are hives appropriate to be placed in a, in a community garden where people will come and go? Um, like, like <sighs> like this, like a two or 3,000 square foot community garden. I've tried here, and because I've, I've tried to offer that it would keep bees here, but they have events. It may not be. Um, although, on the flip side of that, you have places like Essex County. Have you ever been up that way to um, uh, the Iris Gardens and all that in Montclair? They have hives behind the one house there that they keep, and they have community gardens where they keep them. And schools, there's different schools throughout the country that keep them. Everyone thinks there's a huge liability. Um, the chances of being killed by a honeybee is like 10 times greater, I mean, 10 times less than winning the lottery. I mean, you really, 
it, you, to be allergic is one out of 2,000. To die is something like one out of like, I don't know, half a billion or something. But aside of the liability, would it be successful to, to put a hive in a, in a community garden setting? It would be. I mean, it would pollinate. It would definitely benefit them. It wouldn't affect, but, but, their, it wouldn't affect their day to day business. No, no. Um, it wouldn't bother them if people didn't bother them. But the live, I mean, the, if there's too many people around, it, it could be a problem. I mean, because people walking by, I don't know, you know. So you get that one person that swats at them, they're going to get stung. You know, not everyone is up to that level. Or they, they all have to be brought to that level. That's hard. So, any, I, I want to bring you guys up here to look at the propolis. Oh, I have one more question. Um, ahead, can you please. tell us about, don't the bees do a dance for each other to tell them where the... Uh, oh, the waggle dance. All right, so, um, the bee comes back, it goes in front of the hive, and it does this, they figured it out, does this dance. And basically, they're like, I don't know, they go this way four times, and they come back, and then they go, you know, and supposedly every movement shows them which direction and how far away. And that's that's how they also communicate. But they, they triangulate with the sun, I've been told, too. I learned that from sixth graders. One talk I gave, it was like, I don't know how they do it, but they're up there doing it. And they're like, here's the, you know, we found this on the Internet. As I looked at it, I'm like, yeah, you're right. So they triangulate, you know, the, the sun angle at the time and how they go and where they go, and then they come back. And they also, I've read up that they actually, kind of like a like a, a drone, like an aerial, they have a like a, a aerial memory of what's above them, looking down, and they can figure out that's their hive. That's amazing to me. So, but yeah, if you guys, I don't know if more questions if not, if you want to smell beeswax. Um, you want to take some of these catalogs, they're free, they're from last year. If you guys want to read about bee culture, these are all free too. I've got excess here. If you want to take one of these, you're free. And if, yeah, that, and then if... I want to thank everyone uh, for, for coming out today. Uh, we have a few more workshops coming up, one on Thursday and on the Christian, and then... Uh, next Saturday, oh, yeah. about 23, we from the Shady from the Shady Tree Commission will be here. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have it if you want it, but yeah, a lot of people don't know about it. They, they basically, and, oh here, you guys are interested. Take take this. We got a bunch of copies on Propolis that you can read about in the phone.